Hi, good afternoon. Um, this afternoon, I'm going to talk to you about AFB and EFB. And as I correctly gambled, uh, Sarah talked a lot about EFB, so I'm not going to talk very much about it. So she did an excellent job of covering off uh, lots of aspects of EFB. So I'll, I'll just end with a few, um, a few of her own comments about AFB and a little bit about Marta's work. Uh, this afternoon, um, I'm not going to give you a largely research-based talk, although I've uh, sort of uh, laced it with some of her own research work over the years. I'm going to talk more about uh, general AFB management primarily and uh, try and inject a few new things along the way. So uh, in terms of American fowl brood disease, it's a disease that's been uh, with bees for uh, virtually centuries. Um, it's uh, not known, but we used to talk about this disease not being present in certain parts of the world particularly sub-Saharan Africa and some parts of South America, but its, uh, it's distribution is now quite ubiquitous. Uh, I was actually uh, with Real in Chile, I think in 05, uh, when uh, actually uh, American fowl brood was uh, discovered there. <clears throat> uh, they actually blamed the Argentinians, and I realized the rivalry between those two countries then because they blame each other for everything, I think. Uh, but uh, in, the, in the old literature, you wouldn't find many uh, discussions about AFB in Africa, but certainly it's been cultured from honey samples uh, throughout the region as well. So its, it's distribution is not quite cosmopolitan, but uh, certainly close. Um, what is American fowl brood disease? So if I was teaching a lecture, I'd say this might be on the exam, um, but you'll have to gamble. Uh, you should know American fowl brood disease is a bacterium. Uh, and it's sort of key to its success is it's a spore-forming bacterium. So that's the agent that's typically moved around your colonies on beekeeping equipment. Uh, that's what actually infects the very young larvae. It's a disease of brood. If you feed adults billions of spores, they don't break down with the disease. And one thing to remember is it's your very, very young larvae that are typically infected because they're most susceptible within 24 hours uh, of life. Uh, but they can be susceptible up to about 48 hours. That's a fairly contagious disease. Uh, bees are not hapless. They have many mechanisms of resistance at the colony level, at the social level, but also at the individual bee level. And uh, we use many ways of managing this disease. Traditionally, we've dumped uh, antibiotics in our hives, but we're moving away from that. And I'll talk a little bit about some alternative strategies uh, during uh, this lecture. So let's start off with the basics. When we look for AFB, uh, we wish all of our frames had a nice brood pattern. This is a few misses in it, but generally uh, a pretty healthy pattern of brood in our colonies. And for AFB, we're normally looking at the cat brood. So we typically see disease expression, clinical disease expression uh, in the cap stage. So we're looking for caps that are greasy, sunken, uh, punctured. This doesn't always mean you have AFB present but it's certainly a, a harbinger often of a clinical symptom of uh, AFB. Uh, and if we look carefully, we can actually see often a putrefied larvae underneath that perforated cap. You're probably familiar with the matchstick test where you can stick a, a little matchstick in or a, even a, a tuft blade of grass or a tuft of grass and actually string out that putrefied uh, prepupa. If it strings out about an inch, you know it's likely AFB. If it's watery and doesn't string out, it's usually something else. A lot of times I'm often asked if uh, people's tongue is a diagnostic symptom. It is, but I'll tell you it's not very common. We've done a lot of studies where we infect colonies with AFB, and I'm ballparking somewhat, but, but I bet you one in a thousand uh, putrefied remains of, of larvae or pupae are actually, uh, in this case pupae, are actually displaying the pupil tongue at you. It's sort of like a, a middle finger raised to you, but it is diagnostic, but it's not very common actually. Uh, if you took a really good look at scale, it would look like this. This is a microscopic sh shot. Uh, I think one of the biggest uh, impediments to people looking at scale and finding it is the fact they're middle-aged and need uh, progressive glasses. Uh, kind of not a joke because I have them now. Uh, <laughs> anyways, but realize each of those scales contains up to 2 billion spores. So it's uh, an individual scale has uh, an awful lot of inoculum in a colony and bees clean that out and move it around the hive environment. So uh, Michael actually put together this slide, Michael, Michael Pearson, that works in our lab. We've done a couple of experiments uh, over the last few years, and I put it up to illustrate that you shouldn't reuse your old AFB-containing comb. Uh, often I've seen pieces of individual combs that may have a 1,000 scales in. So we know if you put <clears throat> 100 scales in a colony or 250 scales in a colony or 500 scales, 
this is in mid-June, over the progression of the season, you develop hundreds, if not thousands, of symptoms in a colony. Uh, this graph actually shows if you put no scale in a colony and have other colonies close enough, you'll actually get robbing and transmit the disease. But I'll just submit to you, one of the best ways to spread AFB in your operation is through, through the reuse of diseased comb. Um, what we can do diagnostically, Sarah talked about culturing as well, is we can grow this bacteria uh, on very selective uh, media. So in the lab, we can actually grow the organism if we look at it underneath a microscope. We see these uh, chains of cells. Uh, we have various uh, media which selectively grow uh, Panobacillus larvae. And to help us diagnose, in fact, that that is the organism we're looking at. <clears throat> What's kind of interesting is with the advent of molecular technologies now, we just don't see Panobacillus larvae. Uh, in the old literature, you may have seen this disease called other names like Panobacillus larvae, subspecies larvae. You may have even heard of a disease called powdery scale if you're a very, very avid reader and perhaps a little older where it was actually described in some of the literature. We know now this is all one species of bacterium. It has a number of molecular genotypes and they go by the funny names of Eric 1 through Eric 4. Um, this may be a little academic from your point of view, but just realize these different uh, molecular genotypes of this bacterium kill differently. Some are slow killers and some are fast killers. Uh, in North America, we have Eric 1. In other parts of the world, such as in Europe, they do have some strains of Eric 2. But uh, my notes up here indicate that <clears throat> normally with the AFB, we see 25 to 40% are killed uh, up to the capping stage, whereas the majority are killed after capping. Whereas uh, actually here, uh, less than 10% of those infected larvae make it to the capping stage. So. Uh, with these other uh, genetic strains of the disease, they're fast killers. I think that's the sort of take home for you. So Eric 2 through Eric 4 are fast killers. They're not very common. Eric 3 and 4 are exceedingly common in the natural <laughs> environment. And I know this is going to shock you, but we have Eric 5 now. If your name's Eric, maybe this is all very embarrassing. But anyways, uh, just realize for scientists that study this sort of stuff, we know there's more diversity in the different genetic strains of this bacterium. And Eric 5 lives in Spain. It was isolated in honey from Spain. That's hot off the press this month. So what happens when a young larvae actually eats some of those spores? Uh, the spores go into its gut. There's a lining in the gut of a larva called the peritrophic membrane that forms within that first 24 hours of life. Uh, you actually get <clears throat> the bacterium actually uh, multiplying here. Uh, it actually uh, eventually invades the hemocyl. It penetrates through the midgut. You get sort of a whole body septicemia happening. It actually then kills uh, the developing larvae and pupae. Here you see the different eric types. You see the lethal time for death as uh, 100 as being either 12 days or 7 days. It just shows that our eric 1 strains are the slower killers. That may be an adaptation, an evolutionary adaptation to get around the hygienic behavior of bees so that material is not removed as quickly and that bacterium can actually be more successful in reproducing itself and reinfecting other bees. Apparently, according to this graphic, you're left with a poop emoji with flies around it, and then your colony collapses. I think that's supposed to be the putrefied pupae here, and these are the spores. So uh, anyways, uh, I guess they had a limited supply of graphics for making this. All right, we talked about spores. Uh, endospores form within the developing rods. Uh, they form these spores, which I said are very, very hardy. Uh, just how hardy are they? Hardy, how hardy are they? Sounds like I'm talking about uh, encouraging people to go to a party. Anyways, uh, long-lived spores, uh, if you take and look at bacillus spores, which are a related group, you can actually find them to be viable after millions of years in amber. Uh, I'm not suggesting that Panobacillus larvae spores are quite that resilient, but they certainly can leave, live on decades in beekeeping equipment. Um, the other thing about uh, this organism in general is there are mechanisms of resistance. Uh, individual bees have mechanisms of resistance as larvae. Some have to do with the formation of that peritrophic membrane. But it really takes very, very few spores in these experiments less than 10 to affect uh, an individual larvae. So you can think of the spore load in a colony and how uh, useful that might be from the organism's perspective to, to infect. Uh, larvae themselves, and as they age, they become more and more resistant. Um, and in your own colonies, the one way you can think of this is that they're just huge sort of harbors of spores. So if you actually looked at your honey spores, and we actually 
cultivated honey off of store shelves, often we can cultivate AFB from any hive product. So your colonies themselves actually are, are great places for harboring this disease spores. So what are some ways we can actually make our colonies a little more resistant to American fowl brood disease? Well, one is through hygienic behavior. We've talked a bit about this today. It's been a very common topic in a lot of bee talks in the last several years. We can select for this in a recent project uh, done among uh, my lab and Shelley's lab uh, and others. We've actually uh, done work where we've selected for uh, hygienic behavior. And then we've actually done, as I like to say, a lot of anti-beekeeping and actually infected a great number of colonies with American Falbury disease. So if you ever want to do this at home, what you do is you take your old frames full of scales and you actually cut a patch out, you insert this into a good frame and put it into colonies. So what we've done here experimentally is we've tried to sort of standardize that spore dose, uh, or rather the scale dose on a colony level. If you put that into colonies, uh, it is pretty much the most surefire way of having those colonies break down with disease. So we followed these colonies for a series of weeks and then really looked at the way and they actually, uh, at which they actually developed symptoms. So in this case, we did assessments over two uh, or four weeks uh, until the fall and actually plotted out what the actual breakdown with uh, disease looked like. So uh, this is actually through our, our BIPM project when we selected for uh, hygienic behavior. So we had a few different stocks going on here. So by the way, in case you want to know, this is New Zealand stock. This is our marker assisted selection stock. So using our uh, proteomic markers, we selected for hygienic behavior. Uh, we also selected for hygienic behavior with the FAS stock as well, using the freeze kill brood assay. And we had benchmark stock, which was just standard Western Canadian uh, stock bred by our own beekeepers. And what I'm trying to show you in this graph is either with one generation of selection or three, we see similar trends in that some of the stock, such as the New Zealand stock, if you look at uh, colonies that have any visible signs of American fowl brood disease at a colony level, get infected at the beginning of the experiment and never recover. Uh, whereas if you look at the other stocks, you see higher levels of infection and then essentially lower levels as the season goes on, really showing the ability to recover from that infection through the action of hygienic behavior. And if you look at the end of the experiment, you see our purple and green lines cease represent our hygienic selected stocks. So hygienic behavior is a good way of making your colonies uh, certainly more AFB and generally disease resistant. And this is really excellent field data proving the point. Uh, if you extend that and you look at these colonies that were purposely really heavily infected with AFB and say, well, what's the take home in terms of winter survival? We also see better winter survival in the purple and green bars here, again, representing our selected stock at the end of the winter. So you see the proportion of our wintering survival. Again, these rough colonies that were very heavily infected with American fowl brood disease. Okay, so um, there are ways you can make your stock more resistant and manage the disease that way. Uh, I've talked about spores. Spore management is a really good thing to look at. We can look at how spores are moved around our operations. Uh, we can actually look at them in colonies, even if there's no clinical symptoms of the disease. And we can even do things look at, uh, like a determined antibiotic resistance. Um, we can actually look for spores in honey or in adult bees by culturing them in the lab. These series of steps really sort of show how we do that. Uh, we can actually take honey samples, uh, sterilize them, plate them on media that supports the growth of P larvae only, and then incubate them over time. And uh, we've used that data for various things. So Rail is here, so I don't know if he remembers this, but we collaborated quite a number of years ago now and looked at honey samples from Manitoba. And we actually plated the number of spores in honey, for example. Uh, so we could do a detection of, sp so this, is, this graph represents whether we cultured any spores or not from these samples. And this graph represents the actual quantitative numbers of spores. But I'm showing you this just because we can actually quantify and get numbers uh, on the number of spores in honey, which relates to disease risk. And the colored background in these slides represents a moving history of AFB prevalence in individual beekeeping operations, which correspond to these numbers over time. So the beekeeping operations that had quite a history of AFB uh, were ones in which we cultured more spores, and conversely, ones that were quite clean, we cultured no spores. Now these relationships aren't super predictive, but they do give us an idea of the risk of AFB in beekeeping operations. 
And that's something our lab continues to work with, and we're very interested in looking at predictive models of so spores in bees uh, and also in honey. Um, as an extension of this, the work that Carlos Castillo and uh, certainly Patricia Wolfega have done at the National Bee Diagnostic Center uh, was also to look at AFB in samples from the National Survey. Uh, the survey was over four years. Probably some of you here uh, actually participated in that survey. If we look at that data, um, there were a sample of bees taken from your apiaries, and we did lots of things with those, or the MBDC did lots of things with those. And one value added thing that was done was to actually look at AFB spores in the sample of bees. Now in the old days before I had very much research money, we used to get people to actually smash up the bees with a test tube in a, in a baggie, now we have a machine to do that. Michael's probably thankful. Uh, anyways, but uh, <laughs> we, uh, we didn't cu culture them. The individual dots are actually representing colonies so we can actually count them over a series of days. And in this work we did that at four and seven day intervals. And what was really neat from that, and the work done at the NVDC, is we could get a picture uh, not only of uh, prevalence in general, but also uh, AFB resistance. So from the samples in which AFB could be cultured, and remember a number would be clean, uh, we could actually determine uh, A, the number of positive apiaries by culture, or the proportion of apiaries uh, from which AFB could be grown in these tests, and also the proportion of oxytetracycline resistance. So if you look across the country uh, based on several years of data, you can see how many apiaries from which uh, the organism could be grown by essentially passive surveillance here, and also where our resistance lies based on the operations that were sampled. So this is very much value added in, in this case from a sample of bees uh, from an apiary. And uh, we, we might be doing several tests, but certainly this is value added to the same sample. So you can see we've got OTC resistance, uh, at least from this data, uh, certainly still in Alberta and also to a limited extent in Manitoba. Um, the other thing we can figure out by taking these bee samples is some element of risk. So pr some previous experiments that I have done, uh, we actually developed a risk rating index. This is not perfect and we'd certainly like to uh, enhance uh, the predictability of using this, but based on that apiary level sample of 10 colonies from the National Survey, we could also divide uh, the samples into categories of risk depending on the numbers of spores cultivated from those samples. So here you can sort of look at uh, the various year or the average over the four years of the survey and how many beekeepers sort of had a low risk of AFB and actually had a medium risk or a high risk. So we felt that was value added to the beekeeper. Again, that may sort of show the applicability of actually culturing AFB from bee samples or honey samples in terms of a risk model for area-wide surveillance. Who uses area-wide surveillance? Uh, lots of countries in Europe do. Uh, this is just a snap of a a, of a, a map in a Polish paper where they're doing a whole country level uh, surveillance through honey samples in this case. Uh, so actually doing surveillance for AFB could give us a heads up about the uh, propensity for operations to develop clinical symptoms or to look uh, in an area-wide fashion at the development of resistance. Okay, treat with antibiotics? All of you have, right? Some of you don't use antibiotics anymore, which is great. Um, but uh, if you do use antibiotics, that's one way of managing the disease. Uh, now, remember, and you've had this lecture quite a few times, establish that vet client patient relationship because vets are involved in our use of antibiotics and certainly they're gonna have to write you a prescription and be familiar with the operation that you uh, operate and also uh, the way in which you're managing your bees. Uh, what I just wanted to remind you is we have three products that are registered in Canada. Uh, we've been involved in the registration of two of them. Um, the most recent is Lincomix, which has been valid since the 1st of December 2018. Uh, Thailand has been used extensively uh, since the advent of Oxytet. Resistance in Oxytet is still uh, now available uh, through the Canadian Honey Council after uh, Medivet has uh, ceased operations. So we do have three products available to us. Uh, one reminder I always make from the years we've done with testing for Thailand and also Lincomix is the residual nature of some of these compounds. So from some of the data we produced for Thailand especially, um, this is just an example of one graph, but if you actually apply Thailand, this is the label dose at the top, these squares here. Uh, these are the actual residues and parts per billion you'll find in honey supers if you go in and sample at specific times after the application uh, of, the, uh, of the treatment, <clears throat> in this case in the spring. 
So if you apply to the spring, you would have detectable levels of these residues which would diminish over the season. But uh, again, I always encourage people to treat in the fall, although the label does allow spring treatment with a withdrawal period. Uh, many of you sell your honey in places outside of Canada as well, so uh, making sure those residues aren't present is a big deal. So again, follow label directions. The rest of these treatments were experimental. Uh, these are formulations and patties which aren't on the label, but it just shows you the manner in which the product is applied has a big impact uh, on the actual residues you'll produce in your hives. Okay, another way of managing AFB, burn them. Surest fire way of dealing with it, destroy the organism. Do you want to burn your whole operation? Probably not, but certainly if you've isolated cases of uh, certainly uh, resistance developing, this is the surefire way of dealing with the disease. Well, besides burning, there are other strategies that don't involve chemicals and don't, and don't involve bur burning, of course. I think one of our better successes has been the use of E-beam irradiation. Uh, this is done in Port Coquitlam. Uh, last time I checked, we were over, uh, over half a million supers had been processed through this facility. Um, it's a great way of disinfecting uh, boxes uh, and not having to necessarily burn, although we recommend heavily infected comb uh, should likely be burnt. And we also can't process large amounts of honey in this facility. Uh, this is just a graph of some of the work we did many years ago when Adonia was working in my lab trying to de develop a dose strategy for irradiating frames. This just shows frames on their side, and we looked at the penetration of the E-beam through the stack. So uh, a number of the recommendations that are used are based on this work. And uh, again, just remember that uh, any appreciable amounts of honey really uh, stop the penetration of that E-beam and reduce the effectiveness of the sterilization technique. Other techniques that are available to you include things like scorching, uh, using stiff brushes and actually pressure washing, for example. Steam and lye is not something I normally recommend. It's pretty harsh, but it is effective. Uh, this is a disinfectant which isn't currently available, but certainly even mechanical ways of disinfecting equipment that can be washed are highly successful in reducing spore loads beyond uh, or below which they would be infective. People ask me quite commonly about bleach. Bleach is an effective way of disinfecting parts of your hive equipment that can be bleached. We will sometimes bleach actually wooden hive bodies in a, in a big cattle trough. Uh, what you need to use is use at least 0.5% uh, sodium hypochlorite. That's sort of taking your standard bleach solution and uh, diluting it nine parts with water. The absolute minimum concentration is 0.3%, so you need, a, you need a concentration roughly at least 0.5% and higher. Uh, but for, again, for high parts that can be disinfected by soaking, uh, this is an effective way to go. Uh, also, uh, certainly sterilization by using hot paraffin is effective, but you do have to actually have a time temperature combination which is suitable. So typically you have to get to 150 or 160 degrees for these minimum amounts of time for the organism to be killed. Um, the shaking method is a technique um, that has been around for a long time, certainly been used in Europe to uh, minimize the use of antibiotics. The shaking technique uh, really simply is just taking an infected hive and shaking it uh, most commonly onto foundation. Um, there's us actually doing an experiment in which we actually shook uh, bees from an infected colony uh, into a shaker box and then later hive them onto a combination of different types of comb. In our particular experiment, we use both a fully drawn comb and also foundation uh, just to evaluate whether in fact fully drawn comb as long as it was cl clean, uh, clean could be uh, suitable enough to uh, use and actually reduce spore numbers down. Uh, here is a bit of data from that experiment by actually shaking heavily infected AFB colonies. You can actually see the number of colonies with AFB symptoms. The letters in the bars represent the number of symptoms. So if you do nothing, uh, you'll have dead colonies, <laughs> which isn't surprising, but that is the positive control. And based on our experiment, whether you used straight foundation, half foundation, half drawn comb, or fully drawn comb, the results were generally the same. Uh, they essentially made all of the symptoms uh, virtually to zero with a few exceptions, but it just shows you the magnitude of reduction in spores when the bees are hived onto new equipment. They have a period in which they often have to, uh, to uh, draw out new wax and uh, also with that break in the brood rearing cycle. Um, this has often been used by beekeepers in Europe. Uh, we actually cultured uh, spores in honey and in bees. Uh, so from a more scientific view, you can actually document the reduction in the fold numbers of spores within bees themselves. So this is a log scale. You can see 
that there are very, very few spores that we cultured uh, on the first date we sampled, and they're effectively at or near zero for the rest of the experiment. Uh, a few more residual spores could be found in honey, but this number of spores, the magnitude of the number of spores is really quite low. So it was a very effective technique. We did an economic um, analysis of this experiment, which I'm not gonna present, but uh, we compared shaking a colony to actually buying a package or actually just having a regular single. Now, this is a good honey production year, but if you look at the big black bars, this shows the amount of honey produced if you shake. Um, at the same time you hive the package or use that wintered colony. And the economics really suggest that actually shaking that unit was economically feasible and uh, probably more economically um, benefit, uh, would economically benefit the producer better than actually buying a package. So it is a feasible way of actually uh, managing your operation and actually still producing honey if done early in the season. Okay, so what other weird and wonderful things are out there for bees in AFB? Do you know you can vaccinate your bees against American fowlbrood disease? Well, some people think that's possible in the future. This is actually a vaccination that's uh, going potentially into production. So uh, many of us thought actually we couldn't develop vaccines for insects, but it actually is true. Uh, <clears throat> we can actually uh, provide a vaccine, a heat killed bacteria to a queen, and that can actually be passed down to her progeny. Now, the evidence I've seen of this, this is work originally done in Finland, actually shows that the progeny were actually disease resistant. Most experiments I have seen don't really show uh, heavy challenges of AFB to these what are called immune primed bees, but this may be another available uh, option available to us in the future, but uh, I'm actually waiting until the jury sort of decides in, in a field setting whether these actual vaccines will work and actually be an option available for us in the future. Uh, there are other alternative therapies out there. We have been involved with some of these. Um, we've been involved with some groups that have been interested in looking at essential oil extracts. This is not a new idea. We know essential oils have a lot of antibacterial properties, and certainly some can be used against AFB. In my experience, most have been very effective in lab settings uh, in vitro, but uh, don't always translate well to the field or can have incidental carryover to honey in terms of taste. Uh, but that is uh, potentially uh, an avenue in the future. Uh, also, uh, bacteriophages, uh, these are viruses that are actually very, very particular to a certain species of bacteria. There can be hundreds, if not thousands, that could be specific against Pinnabacillus larvae. So some research groups have actually screened these, found the most uh, pathogenic ones, and are hoping to use these as an alternative treatment, although that's still in the developmental stage. And other groups are actually looking at some of the enzymes the bacteriophages produce in the end of their life in which they actually degrade the bacterial uh, cells themselves. So some of these enzymes are actually being uh, evaluated and extracted and actually used as AFB control. So there are some other um, potential uh, things on the horizon for AFB control. Uh, we may evaluate some of these over time where they may become available on the market, but they're not quite there yet. All right, so sort of ending with AFB. Um, Certainly we're in an era where antibiotic use uh, can't be as prevalent as it once was. We can't buy antibiotics over the sh shelf uh, as we once did and, and apply prophylactically. Veterinarians are involved and we have more judicious use of antimicrobials. Uh, I've talked about some other alternative management techniques and perhaps some more, more will be available in the future as we go ahead. Uh, certainly using surveillance can target problems. It can give us a heads up about uh, forms of resistance or potential risk, and that may be an area which expands into the future. And certainly understanding genomics, both of resistance in bees, pathogenesis in these organisms may lead to uh, very new insights about how to manage this organism in the future. So the advent of molecular tools may help us as well. So I wanna end with the European fowl brood. I don't have too many slides because Sarah did a great job of introducing this. Um, Sarah correctly uh, mentioned, and I'll mention it again, that we have a different bacteria that causes European fowl brood disease, Melissococcus plutonius. Uh, we also have a number of associated bacteria that are kind of hangers arounders. So a lot of these actually will sort of, uh, are saprophytic invaders. So once that uh, larva is broken down and dead, we'll actually start putrefying it. So there are a, sort of a milieu of bacteria that are associated with these rotting cadavers in your hives associated with European fowl brood disease. One thing to remember is classically European fowl brood disease 
is a killer in the larval stage and AFB more so in the capped or pupil stage. So that's one way of making a gross distinction about what you may have in your hive as to when it's actually killing the immatures actually in the, in the colony itself. The other is the pathology. You see some typical pathology here, this darkened uh, C-shaped larvae with the very prominent trachea or these breathing tubes. Uh, often the actual larvae are twisted and distorted. Um, if you look in here, we see to see some very classically uh, dying uh, larvae within uh, the comb itself. And uh, again, some of these uh, gross symptoms that I've mentioned as well. So the yellowing larvae or darkening larvae, this corkscrew screw shaped, and the timing of those symptoms relative to the development of the larvae themselves. Um, there's been a lot of talk, and Sarah did a good job of discussing this, about atypical symptoms of AFB uh, or snot brood or other symptomology in the hive. Some people would suggest these sort of symptoms uh, that are highlighted by the red arrows and the ones that magically have not appeared in the slide for some technical reason uh, are indicative of not quite so typical pathology of European foul brood disease. Some of these larvae look like they're melted. Sometimes you have sort of these sunken punctured cappings which appear to be the wrong stage for EFB. Uh, you'll get scale-like symptoms, but they're not brittle like you'd have with AFB. AFB produces a very brittle scale where you'll actually break the comb taking it out whereas they get this kind of rubbery scale, which sometimes appears of EFB, but not commonly. So what we're seeing now is things that kind of look like AFB, but uh, rather EFB, but not really. So you have this atypical uh, pathology happening, and I think Sarah uh, correctly sort of made that link with other uh, genetic strains of the actual organism and how we, those might be moving around the world causing different pathogenesis. There's my other arrows. There we go. Um, what I'm going to end with, just a couple slides, is I want to point out uh, that Marta Guarna, Dr. Marta Guarna, who works with me in Beaver Lodge, has been quite interested in EFB and blueberries. Uh, she's begun a study which hasn't concluded yet, but uh, she's really been interested in a lot of the questions that producers have had. So what they've told us and what we have observed is that colonies are weak, actually, after coming out of blueberries, which isn't really super different than uh, a lot of the things we've seen previously. But um, I guess the way I'd sort of paraphrase it is there's a lot of European foul brood-like symptoms which are not uh, terribly unusual with blueberries, but they tend to persist. Colonies come out of blueberries that are very weak and never seem to get better. They persist with AFB-like EFB -like symptoms. Um, so Marta has uh, led a project which I've assisted with. Uh, she's actually looked at blueberry growers in British Columbia and sampled from those colonies. She has a number of objectives uh, on this particular project, but she's been looking at the growth of those colonies. She sampled bees and bee bread. Uh, some of those uh, individual colonies were supplemented with uh, pollen patties and some were not, and she's been looking at these outcomes. So some of the uh, earlier data from the project um, put up by Marta um, really does show correctly or, or really provides data to reinforce the beekeepers assertions that there have been many more European foul brood like symptoms and they tend to persist. So by Marta's uh, abbreviations here, these are blueberry colonies at the start of pollination, the end of the pollination event and post pollination, which is typically at least four weeks post pollination. So most of these colonies have no or few symptoms at the beginning of the blueberry pollination event. However, at the end and certainly several weeks later, these symptoms persist and actually increase. That's been really verified by careful measurements of these colonies when they come out of blueberries or transported in some case back to Alberta. Uh, other observations looking at a paired comparison from the same beekeeper that operated uh, virtually the same type of bees configured the same way on wild forage versus blueberries where again, that there were very few symptoms at the start or end of pollination, but we had greater symptoms both in wild forage, but also uh, quite uh, a larger number uh, uh, for the ones actually coming out of blueberries. Whereas if we look at uh, the same colonies in wild forage or blueberry at this post-pollination event and score the number of frames of EFB, we see similar results or a larger difference by this metric between colonies that have been in blueberries. So, uh, certainly, um, I guess we're reinforcing the beekeepers' views that colonies and blueberries uh, do poorly and persist with having EFB conditions. So uh, Marta and the people on this project from BC, such as Julie Common and also Heather Higo, have sampled these colonies. Uh, we're actually doing work for pest pathogens uh, and actually have sampled bee bread 
in honey for the presence of pesticides and with a special focus on fungicides. So a lot of this data is not quite available yet, but I can comment um, in a generalized way. And I should also say there's been similar work done in the US with Dr. Megan Milbrath. Uh, Megan's done a very large scale, uh, well replicated study across Michigan. And uh, in fact, uh, Megan has presented a few times at the American Bee Research Conference. And I think there's a few parallels that are, that are emerging. Uh, I know uh, from Megan's work in particular that's a little more advanced, I know what she's found in the US is that uh, there is um, not necessarily consistencies from year to year, but uh, she's found that uh, colonies that have been treated with oxytetracycline, for example, do show suppression of symptoms, but that is sort of a transient observation there. Uh, those symptoms are knocked down. Uh, but uh, if you follow many of these colonies over a longer period, a lot of them will self-recover. That's one thing she's found. Another thing that uh, Megan has discovered as well is that colonies that are supplemented with protein may do well in the short term, but uh, that effect is not consistent. And I think it may have to do a lot with the supplemental forage in an area and whether bees are nutritionally stressed or not. So uh, again, I think there are differences of strains in EFB. Uh, there may be interactions with fungicides which are not yet verified, at least in a Canadian context. But I just sort of put out that to you because uh, Marta should have some more answers for you in the upcoming year or so. And she may be able to tease out some of those factors that uh, are resulting perhaps in the expression of EFB and certainly also with the work of uh, Sarah Wood in Saskatchewan. So with that, I think I'm pretty much out of time. Uh, just thank you for uh, your time and uh, that's about it.